Welcome to uh, the State of Change Learning Festival. Um, I'm very excited, particularly now after hearing this song uh, as an intro for the session, uh, to welcome you all um, to, to the session on innovation in, in portfolios um, that the Mikhail and Ina will be, be hosting in, in a second. I'm just here to, um, to do a quick, quick welcome uh, and, and maybe share one thought um, uh, on uh, the importance of this topic. Um, this, is, this is something we obviously have three stages uh, at, at the festival and one of them is particularly focusing on the sort of machinery uh, or the structures. Um, and certainly this session I think will be sharing emergent ideas about um, uh, ecosystems of portfolios as ways of thinking about probably the institutional innovations or, or how we organize differently how we maybe think differently about the operating model uh, of government uh, in, in these times. Um, so I'm really looking forward to hearing from, uh, from uh, our two speakers today. So we have, uh, we're lucky to have Mikhail Seppale, who's a specialist uh, from Citra. Uh, so Mikhail works with helping organizations adopt innovation portfolios and strengthening their capacities uh, in systems change. Uh, and also we have Ina Olinki, who's the Chief Innovation Officer at the Smart and Clean Foundation Sweden. And Ina helps develop foundations approach to orchestrate ecosystems and, and create innovations from that approach. So, so without further ado, I'll, I'll, I'll uh, let them both explain the meaning of the song um, uh, and as well as uh, kind of describe their work uh, and what they're doing in the session today. The only thing I got from the song, Mikael, was um, Vi skal kæmpe med alt, hvad vi har, which is a Danish uh, translation of uh, something like we, we have to fight with all that we have, all, all that we got. So um, hopefully you can do that as well. I'll, I'll, I'll kick it over to you. Thanks for, for taking the charge of the session. Yeah, thanks, Jesper, and welcome everybody to our session. So uh, if you're still wondering where you are at the session that we're in, so uh, in this session, we're going to be talking about uh, innovation ecosystems for transformation, and um, I'm going to be talking about the, the process that we've been we've been working on at Citra with a bunch of Finnish organizations, and Ina will be focusing on uh, the work that the Smart and Smart and Clean Foundation here in the Helsinki metropolitan area uh, uh, are doing, and what how they're orchestrating an ecosystem of players around sustainability and. Uh, sustainability and circular economy topics and here's an overview of our session so we have about one and a half half hours and uh, and we're going to be starting off with um, some intros between you guys so so it's always fun to uh, get an idea of who's in the talk and following those uh, five minute intros uh, i'm going to be giving my presentation on on the general frame for uh, this this session and then we'll have about 10 minutes for Actions and questions and answers and comments, and after that we're going to be having Ina speaking about um, building impactful systems change projects for about 15 minutes as well, and again another 10 minutes for questions and answers and comments and otherwise. And for those of you who are uh, more focused on hearing the presentations and don't want to necessarily uh, network with other people, we're going to be having a break after that that for five minutes and you can leave. But if you want to continue the discussion with us and, and the other people on, the, on, the, on this international call, we'll, we'd like to invite you to join, join a general discussion around these multi-stakeholder collaboration and, and how, how we could uh, work on transformation a little bit better, better related to that. And at four o'clock, we're going to be ending the session. So uh, like I was saying, just a while ago, we'd like to now um, put you into these breakout rooms with, a, with two to three people and have you uh, meet, meet the people who are online on this call and uh, have a discussion about who you are and what's your relationship to the topic. So if James, you could um, put us into those breakout rooms for a while, that would be really nice. From, from these uh, small rumors now to this main room and uh, I hope you had a nice discussion with uh, who, whoever whoever you met and got some uh, international ex experience through that. I, I had the opportunity to speak with somebody from Canada who was just uh, drinking their morning morning tea, which was really nice to nice 
but yeah, going forward um, to the topic that at hand, I'll share my screen again and talk a little bit about what I was planning on discussing today. Um, so yeah, so so the topic of uh, today's session is uh, orchestrating innovation ecosystems for uh, transformation and um, and like the learning festival is framed around uh, new ideas that that uh, we hope to spark spark inspiration around. Um, I think this topic of um, discussion using using and um, looking at innovation ecosystems as um, ways of organizing for to to make transition uh, transformation. I think that's a really important discussion and the relationship of portfolio innovation portfolios in that context is uh, also something a connection i'd like to help uh, make in this session so um uh I, like i mentioned earlier i'm Mikael Seppala and uh i work at citra in this uh, citra lab so so we're we're uh, part of citra's societal training section and uh, what we try to do do in within citra and uh, for the finnish societies that we we help help facilitate the development of change maker skills and attitudes and opportunities to solve wicked problems and part of that that is um, um, building building and bringing in new approaches and new, new methods that we might use use to do this a little bit better. And the work that I've been doing uh, this this spring especially is related to um, bringing in uh, innovation portfolio sense making and management practices to the Finnish society. So uh, we 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 um, started this type of innovation portfolio network in Finland that consists of about twenty organizations based on Finland, some of them operating internationally, uh, that, that are, are learning more about this approach with us. And uh, to start off that, uh, we, we organized a two-day international workshop uh, with uh, the UNDP and Climate Kick that are very far in this type of approach, and, and also uh, Narrate, which is part of the Cog Cognitive Edge uh, Network and Cora Foundation, which is doing a lot of consultation for UNDP and Climate Kick, just to start learning and building an understand, understanding of what, what innovation portfolios are for and why, why is sense making especially really relevant to that. We published the materials from that workshop online and uh, I might put that into the chat later on so, so you can check, check those materials. After that uh, international workshop in, in which we got like a good un understanding of how to, how to uh, uh, do this type of innovation portfolio work, uh, we dived into um, to a series of workshops with our Finnish, Finnish partners to start understanding this approach better and how to apply that here in Finland and in different type of contexts and to work on some uh, initial experiments in seeing how, how that might fit into the into the context and and we're, we're currently working on a publication on on what we've learned during this this uh, process and we'll be publishing that in in August and uh, maybe the thing that we we in general started noticing when when bringing this type of thinking into into in here in Finland was that um, UNDP and climate kick they're already practicing it and they've done the you know messy bit of of uh, discussing with their managers about how to how uh, that that they want to uh, invest in the, in building these type of pro, uh, capabilities and and uh, the work that we, we we have ended ended up in doing is not that much in the how how to do that i think in this um learning festival we'll have a few sessions especially one from UNDP about the how to do this but uh today we'll be talking about the why why should organize organizations start start um investing in these types of capabilities and maybe the big question is uh, is this so before before the covid situation and uh, and uh, i think a lot of people were out in the streets um, and and really really enthusiastic about um, bringing in uh, systems change rather than climate change and uh, this this issue got a lot of attention all over the world but um, necessarily, I'm not quite sure how how much impact uh, being out in the streets really has in in creating change uh, in the long run. So so uh, that maybe the question is that because you can't really Google answers to these types of wicked problems because there are you know multiple stakeholders involved and the relationships of uh, between the different type of stakeholders create uh, constant change. And then we also have like multiple scales and perspectives related that uh, necessarily the, the practices that we 
are good at as organizations and institutions today uh, are not enough to solve these problems that we're tackling. And, and so uh, one, one, one big shift that we're seeing maybe in, in a lot of places is that we're shifting from this uh, left area where we actually are, can be certain about the problems that we are facing and certain about the, the solutions that we are, we are building um, into this space where we are, we are increasingly having to deal with um, uh, problems that are very uncertain. We don't necessarily know uh, what create the problems and we don't necessarily know how to create the solutions because the solutions and problems are very contextual. So a good example of like uh, a broad scale problem that, that involves a lot of, lot of different organizations that is a co complicated problem is like building an airplane. Usually the airplane companies, they, there's a joke that they, they own the software that use, is used to you know, plan the airplanes and maybe the glue that glues all the, part, all the parts together, but uh, they, they use like hundreds of different um, organizations collaborating around them to, to build an airplane that, that, in no, that, that should be so safe that in no situation uh, it, it should fall down from the sky. And that uh, technical narrow scale problem might be like app, rolling out new application in your organization, which is pretty straightforward. So you install the application on everybody's computer and then, then uh, maybe support the people in learning how to use it. In the, um, I think a distinction that we don't too often make uh, in the uncertainty area is the distinction between adaptive and you know uh, broad scale, broad uh, narrow scale and broad scale problems. So, so um, an adapt a problem that requires adaptation is, uh, for example, tackling uh, the marginalization of one person by using a multidisciplinary team that together has to uh, start forming a, a picture of what's happening and how to support this. Uh, individual in in um, in their life situation that you can't necessarily uh, define up front, but a complex problem that is broad scale that we are not necessarily really really good at currently is um, similar to these adaptive problems, except that you have so many players that that probably have never never met met each other that it's really difficult to bring them all together and. Uh, recycling all the plastic in a city that Ina will be talking about later on might be a good good example of a broad scale problem that uh, is is uh, uh, more difficult than the narrow scale uh, uncertain problem. So so um, like I was mentioning, we're making shift from this this type of you know technical and complicated management where we had these institutions, their leaders who defined strategies and the experts who work, who work them then towards these type of uncertain problems and, and uh, related to, this, to the pro problem types, um, I think we're seeing like two types of organizational forms that uh, are, are you being used to tackle those. So uh, these labs are the hype right now and have been for for a lot of people, a lot of years, and labs are very often focused on, you know, bringing people to, together around these problems and and using facilitators to build these safe environments in which people can co-create to develop sol solutions. But um, when you have a like complex problem in which you have a lot of different type of players, you you need to start building capabilities in which you are able to orchestrate different type of labs, different type of efforts, and uh, weave together, you know, different type of uh, net works and build long-term collaboration between these parties so that together they can start solving these problems. And, and um, one question or provocation that I'd like to make in this session is that will, will these labs grow up to become innovation ecosystems at, at some point? I think I, I'm using this picture to depict that um, I think uh, labs and you know doing the co-creation, learning by doing together is a great, great foundation for this type of adaptive and complex work. But when you when you have more parties involved you have to start you know thinking about investing in hubs and networks and you know building the communication and activities that enable this early community collaboration but and a lot of people um, might have heard about this coll collective impact approach which is an example of a more advanced network in which you the network already has you know some kind of agenda some kind of me uh, shared measurement systems and maybe a backbone organization that is helping the whole network start doing co-creation co co around some kind of societal issue. 
Um, innovation ecosystems that Ina will be talking about more later on are a very mature form of collaboration in which, in which we're trying to do this type of transformational work. And they usually have like some kind of secured funding, could be for a long, long period of time. They might use these portfolios to coordinate and finance this type of uh, work. They, have, they might have uh, platforms to do stuff, infrastructures, they're working on you know, established research, uh, development and innovation work and are maybe able to already tap into not just the strength of individual organizations, but also build on the ecosystem capabilities that are embedded in the different organizations within the network. So in this type of, um, when you're moving to, from, from labs towards these uh, networks and ecosystems, you need different ways of coordinating this work. And I think this is where the portfolio approach that a lot of people are talking about right now is coming in. And the problem that it's starting trying to solve is that rather than you know focusing on these confetti solutions, which are single point solutions that everybody is doing in their own areas, we're starting to move towards this type of systems transformation area where we're bringing these different organizations together and trying to work on multiple interventions at different levels of the system and build this dark matter, the relationships between the people between and over time. So um, whereas like the traditional portfolio management has been about um, um, working on this um, um, decreasing risk and work, working on strategic portfolios, I think uh, the portfolio approach that we're talking about is actually much more about bringing in different aspects of uh, creating impact in a network together. So it's, it brings together, you know, the visioning futures work. It brings together how to assess uh, making an impact. It brings together how to, you know, organize within a network and how to govern a network and also all the interventions that the network should, should be working on to make an impact and create the future that uh, they're looking to do. And a great, great organization that you should definitely look into if you're interested in this approach is uh, Climate Kick, who, who also partic participated in our January event. And this is like the systems innovation methodology of Climate Kick. So they first start by understanding and mapping the systems challenge with the challenge owners. So initially they start bringing these uh, city may mayors and regional leaders, ministers, company, company CEOs together to understand uh, what's needed for change and um, and define a common intervention strategy and um, and the portfolio actually comes in here when you have a bunch of projects that you want to you know start start um, bring together and start building the relationships between these pro projects so instead of you know having this type of uh, confetti approach to these projects that, that seek to seek to make a common impact you want these projects to start you know learning from each other and assessing how how they can make uh, change together and this sense making practice is a big part of how uh, climate kick um, builds the feedback loops between the projects and and also the impact that the projects are trying to build together so um, the way the place where innovation portfolios uh, actually are uh, these practices are, that I'm discussing work is in this transformational uh, context in which you're trying to invent the new stuff. In uh, traditional innovation portfolio management, you often talk about core, core innovation, where you're you know uh, creating new ways of developing existing solutions and adjacent ways where you're developing the next next possible um, solutions and uh, to new challenges, and then the transformational challenges. And usually, organizations you know put maybe 70% of their money into the in, into improving the known stuff and just 10 to 30% into uh, creating the transformational stuff. And uh, an interesting aspect of traditional portfolio management is that it's very organization centric. So, so, um, so, so it doesn't necessarily take into account this, um, this uh, mission oriented aspect where you're actually trying to, you know, pull together resources and efforts from different type of organizations that, um, that try to collaborate to, to uh, build the transformation. So the Observatory for Public Sector Innovation, they've developed this innovation facets me method, which uh, depicts these different sides of a port portfolio and innovation. So you have the enhancement oriented core innovation, the adjacent adaptive innovation, the transformational future creating anticipatory innovation and this category that is very often missing from our portfolio management practices which is the mission oriented practice how do we solve climate change 
how do we bring different organizations together to achieve these type of big goals? So uh, you could make a comparison between a different type of uh, portfolio approaches. Uh, you could look at this type of strategic portfolio management that is organization centric and, and contrast that to the innovation portfolio sense making and management practices. And you can see that the strategic portfolio management is focused a lot on executing strategies through programs and whereas the innovation portfolio sense making management is actually building the uh, foundations for ecosystemic collaboration that could uh, create create change and also like in terms of what i was talking about the scale and scope uh, previously the, the 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 players and actors in this strategic portfolio management are often teams and organizations whereas in this innovation portfolio sense making management you're trying to build ecosystemic capabilities and one thing to note here is uh, the the role of projects so in the strategic portfolio management, you make the plan, then you finance it, and then you execute it. And in this innovation portfolio sense making and management context, you're trying to um, use projects and uh, experiments as experimental means of learning and about and how to tackle the problem. And this also has an implication on the time span. So usually planning and budgeting define time spans by which we operate. And uh, when, you, when you try to achieve a societal transformation or global transformation, you want to focus on the uh, transformation and use that to inform the time spans by which you're organizing. So just to give you an overview of, uh, of, of these uh, innovation portfolio uh, sense making and management practices, um, in Citra, we're, we're doing our first experiments currently just to you know, uh, exhibit the value of this type of approach. That's what we're focusing also with our Finnish partners. And uh, UNDP is a step further forward from that. So UNDP is doing the uh, sense making and intelligence uh, practice. So they're bringing together the different parties related to their, uh, their portfolio and helping them learn and adapt over projects so that they would build an understanding. Uh, Climate Kick is even further than UNDP, so they're doing a lot of portfolio composition work, which means that before uh, they, they are investing in um, bringing together and funding different type of por por projects that have synergies between each other. And, and a, a step even be be beyond that, that the Cora Foundation is talking about is this type of portfolio design or portfolio impact, where you're actually designing the impact of the whole, whole portfolio. One thing to note, note here is that if you want to build uh, fully fledged capabilities in this area, you want to take uh, three to five years to do that. And like I was saying, what we're doing at Citra right now, we're uh, building a shared theory of change. Uh, we're building our portfolio visualization uh, practices and also sense making practices to help help build internal collaboration, which is needed to start uh, taking the first steps towards problems such as this. So this concludes my presentation and uh, I'd like to open the floor for a few questions and answers if, if, uh, if you'd like to ask something. Um, I might have an initial, initial question, Mikael, if, if that's all right. Um, I was uh, taken by your provocation on the, on the lab's um, uh, emphasis in that but it seems to me that you're sort of highlighting that that you know we, we still have a tendency to focus on the front end of the impact cycle, if you will. Um, do you have any suggestions of of how we should think differently about labs, or reorganize labs, or redesign labs, or should we be using labs at all um, when it comes to um, enabling this this sort of change uh, movement that you're describing? I think uh, one of the models for, for organizing labs in a new way is the Accelerator Labs Network from UNDP that is taking, you know, the first steps into this type of, uh, into this type of really globally network, really globally network approach. I think uh, that's an ambitious endeavor, but, uh, but like they will tell you, they're, they're also taking the first steps. So they're trying to learn that what does it actually uh, require to, um, to start doing this type of stuff. So uh, I think this, uh, this um, conference and this festival is really important in, in highlighting these type of questions that everybody is having uh, and so forth. So uh, I, think, I think to answer, yes, just for your question a little bit more, um, 
specifically, I think the relevance is the question of how do we bring together parties from all over. So labs have usually been places where you bring the people into one, one, one uh, space and have them do co-creation and ha have them form a common understanding. But how do you scale that? I think that's the question we're facing currently. Hmm. Right. I think we have a hand up from Tom Beresford. Is that right? Tom? Uh, yeah. Hi, hi everyone. Um, thank you for, for that presentation. Really useful. Um, bit, of, bit of very quick background uh, of where I'm coming from. I'm, I'm working with an organization called Dark Matter Labs on some of the deep demonstrations that Climate Kick have uh, convened. So um, this all uh, is really refreshing to hear lots of people talking about it and, and um, coming together around it. One of the things that we've learned is that it takes a lot to shift people's mindsets towards this quite, you know, sophisticated and different way of working. And I'm just curious to hear any reflections about, you know, how how that journey has been scaffolded for um, challenge owners who who maybe come from very conventional organisations and backgrounds. How are we shifting mindsets uh, sufficiently to support this type of work? Yeah, I think that's a really great question, and uh, it actually highlights the, uh, the a second capability to go with, you know, the, the type of design work. So in design work, we're bringing people together around, you know, some kind of prototype or some kind of tangible thing that we start building building the relationship around. And I think like when you're bringing, starting to build a system you need the more traditional facilitation type of type of uh, capabilities in which you are focusing more on you know building the relationships and getting past the uh, logical and obvious thing and going uh, getting deeper into the area of building uh, trust between uh, people and he helping you know the uh, relationships emerge rather than use some kind of uh, tool to uh, bring that out uh, I know the people who, who work at Climate Kick, they always say that this is really messy work because um, all traditional organizations, they have their own goals. Everybody has maybe their own KPIs that they're trying to follow. And making the shift from that type of world into a world of collaboration is really, really, really difficult. And I think that that's one of the things that um, anybody who wants to engage in building these type of collaborations should also take into account really um, really um, strongly and start building the really capabilities and using people who, who are really good at that type of stuff. So there's a, might have one. Yeah, there's a yeah, couple of one questions more. in the chat, uh, Mikael. Uh, there's one around uh, further uh, additional examples and I don't know if that's something you can share afterwards as well, but maybe if you can mention a few other good examples beyond the ones you, you just met with. Sort of highlighted in the in the presentation. Well, one of, well, Tom was mentioning the work at um, at at Dark Matter Labs, and Dark Matter Labs works with this uh, Swedish uh, network to build uh, climate neutral uh, cities called Viable Cities. I think you should look into that because um, because Viable Cities has a budget of one uh, one hundred million euros. They have a time span of ten years. And they have a coalition of, of about uh, 60 organizations that are public, uh, governmental, they are, they are cities, they are uh, private organizations. And they're actually take, taking this long-term view into, into uh, really uh, trying to achieve a societal goal. I think that's a really great example uh, of how of this type of ecosystemic practice, practice in a practical context. But, but thanks. We have time for one more, or was that it? Well, I think I think we might move on. We can get back to these questions that in the discussion session later on. But uh, maybe maybe if we um, give Ina her turn now and uh, continue with that later. Thanks. Hi. Um, so my name is Ina, and um, first of all, I have a bit of a hay fever situation going on, so I'm not actually crying, although it looks like that. Um, so I'll, uh, I'll start sharing my presentation immediately because I, the, that tells you more about the organization that I work for and explains kind of uh, 
um, the, sorry, that was not what I was going to do. Share the screen. Wait, 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 why is my... Are you seeing it now from... Is this visible now to you? The presentation? Not yet. No? Okay, what's going on with me then? Um, let me go back to you. Here. Is it better now? Yep. All right. Okay. So first of all, a couple of, of, of words about the organization that I work for, because it's it's a sort of an innovation in itself. Uh, Hello. Sorry? Hello. Okay. Um, so I, I work for an organization called Smart and Clean Helsinki Metropolitan Foundation. And first of all, this is what we work with. Uh, uh, we're sort of uh, working on the Helsinki metropolitan area uh, on climate change issues uh, related to cities. And we think that the, the, the kind of um, solutions that we find in cities uh, locally can have an, a, a global impact because, because of most of the uh, climate problems are situated in cities, but also a lot of the innovation capabilities are, are in cities. So, so, so we think that this is a good sort of test laboratory for uh, solutions. So our foundation is, is um, um, a sort of a strange uh, foundation in itself because it's it's only uh, in existence for five years. So we will we've been doing things for four years and we only have one year left. So it's it's more a change project uh, that that was uh, um, started as a, as a foundation, and we have uh, all the metropolitan cities in in. Uh, in, in the Helsinki region as, as partners. Uh, then we have all the universities that are here. We have three ministries and 14 companies. And these are, for those who are not familiar with the Finnish society, these are all pretty big companies. So some of Kone, for example, which is one of the largest elevator companies in the world and, and, and several uh, energy companies and so on. And the idea was in the beginning that, that they all put uh, together um, a, a, a sum of money and uh, so, so we got a, a budget of about uh, 6 million euros for the five year period. And the idea is that, that, that uh, since they all paid, they also all part of the, the supervisory board and, and the, the, the board of the um, foundation. And the idea is that the uh, decisions made about the, the kinds of projects that we will be working on will be made by these corporations and, and cities and, and the uh, research institutes together. And that's kind of the, 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 the first innovation that we've been working on is, is to, to actually have uh, these people who are not on an everyday level talking to each other. Uh, now they come together in our board meetings and decide on the climate solutions that we are working on together. And, and they are usually uh, uh, represented by the highest level of the, of the uh, organization. So we have the uh, uh, rectors of the universities, we have the mayors of the cities, and we have the, the CEOs or, or somewhere around that level from the corporations. So basically, when they make a decision, uh, there's the, the actual possibility that this will be implemented in their, in their uh, uh, company or, or organization. And so what our role is, is uh, uh, we, so, so this, this kind of public private model that we've built um, is one thing. And then our um, role is to, to work as an orchestrator, someone who is able to uh, think about the solutions that, 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 that the climate change needs, and then to, to actually bring together all the people that we, we, we need to, or, or, or the different organizations that we need in order to, to actually be able to, to come up with the solution. And I'll, I'll walk you through an example of that so you understand better how what we do. But so, um, you are probably all familiar with this, but, but this was kind of the uh, 
sort of starting point for, for the work where we realize that we really need to start making uh, more systemic, bigger uh, solutions because the IPCC gap report from 2019 pointed that we are on a path to um, um, a 3.3 warming of, of, of climate and whereas our aim should be 1.5 degrees. So, so we really have to start accelerating the solutions that we come up with and we really have to start thinking about how to change uh, bigger systems. Uh, so, so kind of the structures of today will become worthless in about uh, 10 years or so from now. And so a lot of the assets that we have now will lose their value. So for example, coal and, and, and things like that will not have the value that they have today. So we have to come up with, with, with new ways of, of doing things. But at the same time, it's a big opportunity to, to actually change. Um, it's a big opportunity for companies um, to, to come up with new innovations and start working uh, in a different way. And it's also a big opportunity for, for this kind of collaboration that we are working on. And what we thought here in the Helsinki metropolitan area is that, is that, that uh, we have the capabilities in our structures to actually uh, be the people who can make this kind of change happen because we have a very good education system. Uh, we have a, a, a high level of technological skills here. Uh, we have a lot of trust. It's a, it's a small society, so kind of a first name basis between all the people here. And we have enough wealth to be able to, to actually um, uh, start new things here. And uh, I'll go back a little bit. So, so there, there's also, we think, an obligation to use these kinds of uh, assets that we have here to, to uh, make changes. So when I'm, I'm saying that, that we um, make impactful systemic change project. I'll, uh, this is kind of the concentration of what we mean by it. Uh, what we think is that first you have to understand the big picture of what we are living with. And I'll, 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 I'll give you an example in a second. Uh, so you have to understand, for example, where the CO2 emissions come from and, 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 and what sorts of solutions you need to, to impact that. Then you need to utilize data and calculate the impact so that you know that if you're thinking of a solution, um, what's the actual impact that, that you will have with that solution. And only after that you should choose your problem. So, so um, this is a little bit different from an, uh, uh, kind of a traditional EU funded project, for example, where it, it's more um, thinking about some innovation from, from uh, a couple of companies or universities and thinking about that, we want to start with the, with the problem and, 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 and starting to uh, find solutions for that. And only after you've chosen uh, the, the, the right problem, you should think about what the ecosystem is that you need, who are needed in order to make that solution together. You need uh, leadership models to, to uh, make um, it possible for um, these projects to be led. And then, um, like I said, we work as an orchestrator. So we are the ones who will calculate the, or, or utilize the data and calculate the impact, uh, bring together the people, uh, uh, sort of work as the secretary for the leadership models, um, uh, come up with, with, with new uh, partners for the projects and so on. So, so, so kind of like an active neutral uh, actor who, who is able to um, talk to a lot of different people and, 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 and kind of like uh, actively work on bringing the, 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 the solution um, to your realization. Then you need the, the, the solutions that you have, uh, have to utilize real infrastructures and services. So um, the, the, the um, things that we are thinking about, they have to be able to, so, so for example, I'll give you an example of the uh, closed loop plastics pro uh, project that we are working on. So, so we have all the biggest uh, waste management companies in the area. We have all the cities and, and thinking about the procurement. We have uh, the, the actual industrial partners who run the, the uh, plants that, that, that are able to recycle plastic and so on. Uh, but then you also need to think about how to inspire behavior change because you can't uh, change anything unless uh, you are able to change the, the overall population's view of, of um, uh, a certain issue. 
Then you have to influence regulation because sometimes regulation is the fastest way of changing the world. If you say that all plastics have to be recycled, that's going to force all the industries and the cities and so on to, to start working on the solutions. But sometimes it's better to use incentives. So, so that can be a way of, of influencing uh, behavior. And then you also have to think about funding models because uh, most of the funding models that we have, at, at least in Europe, are, are usually used for uh, projects that uh, last two to three years or so. But some changes take a lot longer. So, so it can be 15 years or something. And it, it might have public sector and private sector and universities and, and ministries and so on all working together. And, and, and usually you don't have one model that, that uh, is able to fund um, that, that kind of work. So this is the, the, the sort of the uh, overall picture of, of how we work. Uh, and when I said that, that you have to understand the big picture, this is the CO2 emissions in the Helsinki metropolitan region. And on the left side, where you see the waste management, transport, electricity and heating, these are the, the, the sector-based emissions that cities are usually working on because these are the emissions that are actually born inside the borders of the city. So when, um, when, when usually when we talk about the emissions in a city, we only talk about that part. But there's this whole uh, other area that is consumption-based emissions that can, can be manifold to the actual uh, sector-based emissions. And um, a lot of the times, uh, because these are not emissions that are born inside the city borders, but they are emissions that are born, for example, in China or India or somewhere else where you are uh, uh, importing the goods that, that people use, for example, a lot of electronics or um, clothes and textiles or, or things like that. Uh, you are not thinking about that, that you should also be uh, finding solutions to tackle these uh, emissions. So, for example, the city of Helsinki has a plan to be carbon neutral by 2035. And, but this only tackles the sector-based emissions, so mobility and heating and energy and, and waste. But even if they are able to do that by 2035, uh, the, the problem is that if they don't look at the consumption-based emissions, they will still be, uh, that the people here will still be uh, using goods um, and, and consuming things so that actually their uh, emissions per capita are five times as much as the world can actually live with. So th this is the reason why you, why, why you sort of have to think about the big picture and understand what you're talking about. So now I'll give you an, uh, a, a practical example of how we work. So you are all aware of, of, of plastics being um, a, a challenge to the world, that there's, there's um, uh, three kinds of problems with it. One is that, that it's a, um, a throwaway mentality. We don't use many materials like we use plastics, that we use them once and, 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 and we throw them away. And then there's a lot of CO2 emissions coming from plastics, both from the production side and then when it's burned in, in, in serrators and so on. And then the third one is the, the problems with the oceans that, that, that everyone knows about. Uh, this is the, the current picture of, 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 of uh, virgin plastics that are recycled in the Helsinki metropolitan region. So uh, out of the amount of, of plastics that we use, and even though we all have a, a yellow container in our, in our backyard to uh, collect the, the, the household plastics, only about 6% of the plastics that are collected to, are turned into new uh, uh, recycled plastics material. So, so this was the first thing that we did. We, like I said, we use uh, data to, to understand the problem. So, so first we, we, we had some, uh, uh, consultants working on, on, on actually understanding this picture because no one had these figures before we did this. Um, then the second thing we did was we calculated the potential of, of uh, how much of the plastics, if you include the hard plastics that are in toys or shoes or uh, the construction plastics that are used in, in, in building houses and so on, if you would take the maximum uh, or the maximal amount of, of uh, all plastics that could be recycled, it's around uh, 65 to 70 percent. You, you will never be able to get it to 100 percent because some of the plastics are too dirty to be recycled or, or they are too connected to other materials so that you can't take them apart. But if you were able to get to the, uh, the, the kind of maximal potential of, of recycling, uh, 
we, we made the calculations that then um, the CO2 emissions from the plastics, just because they are recycled and not burned and, and new, new plastics are not produced somewhere else, uh, we would be able to save the, the um, yearly emissions of approximately 80,000 uh, people in the Helsinki metropolitan area, which is about 8 to 10 percent of the population here. So this is, um, like I said in the beginning, if you understand the impact of the solutions that you are making, then, then you, you understand that, that actually by making this sort of uh, solution possible, there is a, a real impact to the climate and and so it's worth doing that's kind of like the, the the logic that we use when we talk to different partners about this that if you come along this is the end result that we will end up with and then we build a, a model of how uh, this kind of project could be uh, run and 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 this is sort of like showing you the uh, the possibility of different kinds of, of, of organizations working together. So if you start from um, about 11 o'clock, um, first of all, you have to start thinking about how to sort and, and, and uh, recycle th plastics at home. So, so where do the hard plastics that we are not collecting at the moment, how, how do you figure that out? Um, how do you sort it? How do you recycle? How's the uh, logistics run? How are the construction sites uh, made to uh, collect their plastics? Or if you take a house down, uh, how, how do you collect those plastics from there? Then you have to think about the industrial processes, so both mechanical and chemical recycling of, of uh, uh, plastics. Then you have to think about what, what are you going to do with the materials? How do you make it into new products? So you need more uh, recycled plastic producers and products. Then you have to think about how the supply of those plastics is worked. So, so how do you get it to all the supermarkets and how, how are the supermarkets actually uh, advertising that, that we are selling more recycled plastics instead of, of virgin uh, plastics. Then you have to think about the behavior change. So, so kind of like changing the demand. So you have to need to have the supply of the new products, uh, but you also need the, the demand from the, the, the people of the city. Um, then, then you also need to think about replacing plastics with other materials. Then you have to think about cities, which are huge buyers. Um, how, how can they change their procurement uh, criteria to favor uh, recycled plastics? Then you have to think about how the, the design of the plastics is done, so the eco-design, so, so that they are easier to take apart from other materials and that they are yeah, better to or easier to, to recycle. Um, then you have to think about the regulation and incentives. And, and once you figure out this kind of like the, the, the darker pink uh, circle, uh, only then you start thinking about all the kind of sub-projects that you need. So do we need a design competition for household sorting uh, systems or uh, how do we get the, the, the recycled plastics actually into the supermarkets and, and, and what can they do there and, and things like that. And, and after that you start thinking about all the actors. So these are all actors that we've talked to and, and kind of like uh, um, gotten involved in the project and, and, and then you start seeing that there's a huge amount of, of actors uh, that, that you kind of like have to talk to all the time and keep them in a, in a kind of close uh, relation to the project. Uh, but then what you get in the end is, is that, that, that you understand that the CO2 emissions uh, will be impacted by the closed plastic circle. And the interesting thing here is that it impacts uh, waste management, it impacts heating, and it impacts consumption-based emissions. So, so kind of here's what we mean by a systemic um, thing, because it's not only um, uh, like concentrating on, on one of the, the sectors. Uh, but then there's also the, the, the other thing that's good, there's a potential for new jobs. So, so a circular economy in itself um, can produce about 500,000 new jobs in the EU. And circular economy of plastics uh, generates 25 times more jobs than, than just using landfills and 10, time more, uh, 10 times more jobs than, than burning plastics. So just in the Helsinki region, we would be or will be able to create about uh, 1,200 new jobs if we get the recycling rate uh, increased. So this is another kind of, of uh, impact that, that uh, we use in the communication of the, of the results. 
and and so the, the last thing the impact uh, can be talked about or, or, or thought about from from many different uh, perspectives so there's the co2 emissions there's the circularity of, of material there's business potential for new innovations in for, for uh, companies uh, there's social and environmental impact um, so zero waste no plastics in nature waters and there's innovation potential for um, different actors in the in, in the process and then like i said there's the the employment uh, impact so this is the um, uh, kind of in a, in a nutshell of, of of how we uh, work on on, on impact led uh, innovation solution uh, projects thank you So I thought that was incredibly impressive. Um, Mikael, do you want to jump in here or should we take a couple of questions? I think we should take a couple of questions and then see how many of those we have. Um, so there's one from Leah. I don't know, Leah, if you want to elaborate yourself, but you, you were talking about um, at what points the communities and citizens are involved in, in developing and making decisions about these systemic change uh, projects. Um, yeah. um, well, I think that they are involved in, in many processes. First of all, they are, um, um, they create the demand for the, for the, um, for example, the recycled plastics products, uh, because that there's quite a lot of awareness of, of, um, the, 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 the kind of badness of using, um, bridging plastics these days so if there's demand there will be more supply then of course they are they are voters uh, so they are able to um, have uh, an impact on on how the city for example uh, does things so so that they can change the procurement criteria or or um, how they are saving plastics in the construction sites and so on or if they have demand for the uh, waste management companies uh, that they want to recycle their toys or their shoes or, or, or other things, uh, then their the demand will be answered by, by the supply of new services. So I think in, in, in many ways, but, uh, uh, but, but we are not ourselves directly talking to, you know, people as such, but, but it's more like they are uh, part of the process in, in, in different uh, ways. Right. Um, I'll do a, a quick plug and then Philip has a question. Um, tonight we are having uh, another session that is about designing collaborations for urgent courageous change and there will be much more about uh, kind of citizen involvement uh, on, on that one. So, so if you're interested in that topic, um, jump, jump on board a, a little bit later today. Um, Philip asks a question around resistance. So how do you deal with resistance when it, it's needed? Um, sorry, I lost the... Uh, the, the needed network, like uh, when people or institutions refer sh short term gains over long term effects. Yeah, well, that is something that 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 we have to deal with constantly. Um, that's I, I think that the best way that we've come up with is to actually use these sorts of presentations and these kind of like talking about that. Hey, you know, you come here and, and work with us, there will be this impact on the climate and there will be this impact on the, on the jobs. So, so, so that it's, um, it's kind of like educating people at the same time about these things and, and making them understand that, that they are part of a community that can together make a change. And I think that it, it's more from that. So, so not just like uh, talking about just one organization, like, hey, maybe you should start doing something with recycled plastics, but making them understand that if they are working together, the impact is much bigger than what they would be able to do alone. Right. Yeah, Mika, um, do you want to jump in? Yeah. Yeah, I think I think I was commenting in the chat that I think uh, what what Ina was talking about is really highlighting the the added, added benefits of the innovation ecosystem to this portfolio approach. So when you're talking about the portfolio approach, you are talking about the projects that that are are uh, within the ecosystem. But uh, what Ina was talking about is that 
in, in, the, in their uh, innovation ecosystem approach, they're able to connect the projects and also the different organizations that are working on, on those projects. And each of those projects or sectors that Ina was highlighting could be you know, a series of different co-creation projects where you're bringing different people together. So, so this is like operating at a different scale than, than the labs that you, we were talking about earlier. Hmm. Right. Do we have time for one more question, Mikhail, or do you want to jump into groups at this point? Uh, I think I think Ina, you can decide. Do you want to take a, another question, or should we take a short break? If someone has an urgent question, of course I can answer that. But better, you can also um, send me an email at any point, and we're very, very happy to to share any experience that we have with this. So. Okay. Yeah, so, so let's take one more, but otherwise bring your questions into the group's uh, discussions. Yeah. Um, there's an interesting one here from Marcella um, talking about how this approach would work in a context where the complex problem is not as clear as climate change. I mean, you can maybe discuss whether that's clear or not, but, but maybe less urgent. Uh, something like, for example, as she was saying here, the healthcare system. Um, uh, are there... Um, are there any differences? Is there a particular um, kind of um, uh, contextual value in, in working on something like climate change as opposed to the healthcare system or, or other problems? Uh, well, we are only working with climate change, but I, I, I've been working for the city of Helsinki um, earlier and, and, and with, with a lot of different innovation projects and so on. But I think that the the, the thing is exactly what you said, that there's this sense of urgency with climate change that actually makes it easier for us to, to press on the need to make these solutions. So, so even if we were saying the same things about healthcare, for example, or um, anything else, I, I think that there's always this thing, yeah, but we can you know think about different kinds of ways. But here, the sense of urgency uh, makes it better to start working on something that will actually have an impact uh, because you know that there's only a certain amount of time that we have left. And, and since it's kind of a global thing, it's, it's easier to talk to people about that, that you know, we all, and that you should all join and start the, uh, sharing the solutions that you have. So, so that's another thing that we do. We, we talk to a lot of uh, international audiences because we, we want to tell them that this is one approach that we found that we think can work and we are very happy to learn from you. So, so it's, it's, it's not a, um, a situation of competition, but more of, of like sharing. Hmm. Right, thank you. Over to you, Mikael. Yeah, so so uh, thanks uh, everybody. So this concludes our main session. So if you don't want to join, join our general discussion, uh, we'd like to thank you for your participation so, so forth. But, uh, but uh, we, we were planning, planning on a general discussion around this topic that I'll show you. Um, hold on, I have a slide here. So, so uh, I think I think like I was setting up setting up this um, this session and uh, and um, and speaking to why we're we are hoping to engage in a discussion related to um, how do we bring together you know this uh, ecosystemic approach that that has a lot to do with the networks that are able to tackle these global. Uh, problems that require transformation and also also the portfolios. I think the general um, question that we'd like to learn learn with you is that uh, what are your experiences in uh, enabling this multi this type of multi stakeholder collaboration for transformation? And what are your thoughts and uh, how do we how should we take this type of approach forward? So uh, we'll open the discu general discussion around this type of question or anything else you'd like to uh, share related to this topic. And you can post your uh, comments in the chat or, or raise your hand in, in, in the uh, Zoom participants area if you want to 
want to start and comment on this question. So it looks like Tom has his hand up. So Tom, please. Thank you. Um, thank you everyone who, who's contributed so far. Um, one of the things that feels really uh, challenging, but also critical in this type of work is how you renew governance arrangements so that we're not just talking about kind of loose collaborations like we would when we're thinking about networks, but rather are looking at meaningful long-term cooperation um, around what would be a number of different interventions, a number of different experiments, a number of different collective actions. Um, governance feels really critical. Um, and it's really complicated. So I'm curious as to what um, what kind of governance arrangements or new ways of thinking about governance others are, are kind of coming across that feel like they enable this type of working. I'll pose that question back to you, Tom. So do you have any good examples of that? Um, we're, we're trying to think through what at least some of the ingredients uh, might be. So particularly in, in the context of transitions. So if we are trying to um, overcome some complex uh, challenges that are related to, to transitions like climate transition or the transition around um, technological disruptions in the labor markets, for example, um, are there different kinds of governance arrangements that, that need to, um, uh, to, to, to kind of manage that? Um, and a few of the things we've spoken about already, the, how, do you, how do you set big missions that cut across lots of different um, silos uh, and, and set goals that a number of different stakeholders are invested in, in the long run. Um, but also something slightly more tangible around resourcing. How do you how do you resource collectively resource um, these sorts of um, coordinated uh, efforts? Um, and there's a really big question about how you shift financing models and investment models from very projects oriented return on investment kind of logics to ones that um, maybe have some slightly different makeups that, that force that long-term co-benefits agenda. Um, but this is all really new. Um, it's all really new and conceptual and we're trying to kind of find ways to, to test those different ingredients out. Um, but I'm you know, curious to hear if others have, have explored you know, what those ingredients might be. I think Patrick might have a thing to say. He's certainly raised his hand. Um, I guess my experience is in the food and beverage industry, so it's a business uh, where the problem is that the unit of organization is the enterprise and not the network. So everybody thinks selfishly, as it were, uh, as opposed to public systems that are used to collaboration of some kind or other. <laughs> but the governance uh, was in finding, mapping the structure, the connection, the interdependent relationships, and then uh, how the products evolve from genesis to ultimate consumption. The second part of it Patrick, I think we was, lost you. You, you, you lost your voice. Ah, sorry. Um, let me just go. Oh, we can't hear you. It's a, I think it might be a bandwidth issue. Can you hear me now? Can you? You can? Okay. I don't know how far I, how far you were with me. Uh, very quickly, experience was in the food and beverage industry uh, in Australia and uh, how to get that ecosystem going from 
farm to fork. And uh, we mapped initially the structure, the connections, the interdependent uh, relationships, and then how the products evolved from genesis to uh, fork or, or end consumption. Uh, but the collaboration to do that, we needed to find um, uh, people in pain. Uh, otherwise, they didn't, they weren't interested in, in movement. But if we could find somebody who was a practitioner in pain and had a problem but couldn't recognize the solution, we started there. Um, and then uh, the governance uh, was top down, but the ecosystem formation was bottom up so that you had to show and tell benefit, value, and so forth, something very quickly. And uh, usually with one store, one distributor, one manufacturer, and some farmers. Uh, once that was proven, then self-enlightenment, self-greed or whatever took over in that the other uh, supermarkets and uh, distributors and manufacturers quickly uh, uh, copied the system and uh, adopted it. So the, the getting it going was a bottom-up uh, approach uh, that could scale and spread. But then governance has to come from the top down so that uh, uh, the governance, uh, uh, there had to be frameworks uh, that a uh, governed all the connections and interactions and then uh, the second part of the framework was to have all of the standards and protocols for the for self-organizing uh, participants in the industry uh, to initiate adopt adapt and evolve with uh, i hope that's not confusing Thanks, Patrick. Spot on. Really, really great that you shared your experiences uh, with us. I think that's a really great example of how to do that. And uh, in Finland, when we were looking at also this type of same, same question that how do we support this governance of these, these type of uh, issues, we were looking at how different organizations are supporting that. And one of the initiatives that we were looking into was the Wicked Labs in Australia. And we happen to have Emily Humphreys from the Wicked Labs online with us. Emily, would you like to share some of your experiences related to this topic? Yeah, so we take a network governance approach. So that's where um, in our framework, which I've shared, and if anybody wants, um, a, there's a link to the paper. So if you have access to an academic library, you can get it there, but also reach out if you want a copy of a pre-publication version of that paper. Um, so we take a network governance approach to our systemic innovation labs. And essentially that's a multi-stakeholder core team who come together to lead the lab and the work of that lab with reach into the ecosystem. Now, what we've found in the different labs that we've run, it all depends on who is the kind of lead sponsor of the lab. So for example, we've got a dual government level lab. So we've got a local, it's a partnership between what in Australia we call local councils, but it would be a local authority or a municipality. And then we have a state level government. So we're a federation here. So we have states and then a federal system and so it's a partnership between state and local level. Um, and they're looking at um, greening in, um, in Adelaide. So the wicked problem is um, how to make suburbs greener. Now that lab is being primarily led by the local government and the state government partnership. And so that's kind of picking up on what Patrick was saying. That's the kind of top down with 
representation from the ecosystem on the core team. But what we found has also worked really well is another lab, a systemic innovation lab in Western Australia. And that was being led through research that was happening at Edith Cowan University. And that was um, a, um, they had a reference committee that sat alongside the kind of core functional team of the lab that had great reach into the ecosystem. So it already had deep connection and a whole lot of trust. So going back to what Patrick was saying, you know, that pain point, it's also what, you know, the what's in it for me in terms of giving over my time to be involved in this. So if there's no real immediate pain or no investment in the problem, then it's hard to get engagement. So we um, would say there's a bit of work to do before the lab, which is a bit of system steward work. And I'm not sure if many people have seen the stuff of um, like Lankley Chase, which are behaviours for systems change. And that's kind of a nice, you know, it's, it's a readiness test of whether there's an app appetite to take this kind of approach. And then you can work out whether you have a, um, an ecosystem that's already quite connected or mature and you're trying to transition that ecosystem or whether you have to try and build the ecosystem or whether you're building connections in the ecosystem. I hope that makes sense. And then that will inform the kind of governance that you would, that will be appropriate for that kind of lab in our work. Thanks for sharing. Somebody in the chat uh, asked what the tool is called. So it's Wicked Lab, I guess. Yeah, I can put a yeah, link can... in. Yeah, yeah, for the tool. But but I think like the question that Tom Tom asked and that we're trying to answer right now is that we we are we should have governance uh, approaches for this that are able to incorporate the funding models, the ways we build trust within between mm -hmm. people who we don't who don't necessarily know each other and. And uh, how do we have visibility into the different projects that we're, we're working on together, so that we can these ecosystems can work together? And and uh, and like a lot of players in this field are saying that this is an emerging practice, so we don't really have any established <laughs> ways of doing this. Um, in the chat, there was uh, somebody was mentioning the work that Tom uh, Tom Mitchell from Climate Kick was. Uh, working on this and I, I put a, a link to this webinar we did with uh, Dominic Hofstetter from Climate Kick and, and um, they're also very explicit in, uh, in saying that, um, that um, uh, in saying that, oops, yeah, they're very explicit in saying that they're also learning about these practices, but, but mm. the importance of, of establishing these type of uh, governance and collaboration practices and funding models to support that is 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 really critical for us to be able to tackle um, the uh, big scale problems we are facing today. Can I add one um, other thing into the conversation? So we're working on a um, a research project for a federal department um, here in Australia around um, the readiness of a, a whole federal department to take a complexity based approach to systems change. And one of the key things in that report that's really interesting is changing the procurement conditions for government to work this way. And I often liken it to, it's like telling people they need to change their accounting practice. Like it's so embedded and their relationship to cause and effect and the idea that they can control and design these initiatives that are, you know, running out, you know, for us across vast distances. Um, it's a massive shift. And so there's, you know, all these moving parts that you're trying to, you need to kind of the, it's not just culture change, it's systems change within government to be able to do systems change. So, you know, it's a bit meta <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. Thanks for sharing. Uh, Ignacio has his hand up. Yes. Hello, uh, good afternoon. Uh, this is Ignacio from Gamma Kick. I'm going to make a short intervention. So uh, I was, um, I was uh, reading a lot of questions regarding how we are approaching this. Uh, as you say, we are experimenting. 
but it's true that we have been working on the, this kind of innovation since many years. Right now, we are working on what we call the deep demonstration approach. The deep demonstration is actually what Tom was uh, uh, telling you regarding the city. So um, I agree about what Patrick said. I mean, we, we are trying to uh, find a level when the bottom up and the top down approaches are you know, uh, in there. So this means that we want to work with NGOs. We uh, want to work with politicians. We try to put this social engagement, this innovation, innovation policy, this uh, kind of governance. I mean, we try to mix up all these different levels and we do, for instance, what we call uh, deep listening. Deep listening is to understand really what is happening in the uh, region, in the city, in the place. Uh, on the deal demonstration, we have like eight uh, different ones that we are uh, working right now. One is uh, one is in the maritime sector, for instance. So in the maritime, you have to listen the workers that are there, but also the big companies and also the, the, the logistics. I mean, if you think about the whole value chain, you realize how many people are interacting on the same level. So somehow the port at the end is like a city itself, right? It has citizens that are all the time in there, and those voices have to be heard as well. That's why we are trying to uh, compile everything uh, through a stakeholder mapping and later with uh, a lot of events that we want to hear all voices. So later for these complex projects, you will uh, not uh, be the winner, but somehow you will reach what you are trying to get. But of course, this is a lot of iteration during the whole journey. So I mean, it's about monitor, it's about evaluation, it's about learning, and again, you are iterating and iterating again and again. Uh, I think I think you're Ignacio touching upon like one big shift in this type of thinking. So I was referring to the time spans in my presentation, and you can't you know fit uh, this type of discussions that Ignacio is uh, is uh, describing into two hour meetings. It, the change doesn't happen at that scale, so you need to take a lot of time. And what I understand from the climate kick uh, approach and what the work that UNDP is doing is that they take four days to start building the, the common understanding between the people. So <laughs> that's an aspect to, to uh, uh, take into consideration. Mikkel, could I just jump in quickly and say there is a very entertaining uh, thing on Netflix uh, if you want to see massive change. And it's called The Black Godfather. Um, and it's a guy who changed the whole music industry. And at one point, he had all the stakeholders around the table. And each of them asked, answered what they were doing there. Until finally, somebody turned to this guy, Claire Avon, and said, who are you and who are you representing? And the guys from the record company said, all of us. Now, that's a, a, in other words, there was a facilitator that was covering everybody's back, as it were, that, that brought about the change. And then the trust in that individual caused a massive change in the uh, music industry. And if you have a look, if you've got Netflix, I'd encourage you to have a look at it. It's a quick documentary of two episodes, I think. Thanks, sounds great. Uh, hey, one question, because like I, ne I, I find all of this type of cool people on Twitter and in meetings like this, but I don't really have an understanding of how, how uh, spread this is all through the uh, globe. So Jesper, I think going back to states of change and you have this global perspective into innovation, how, how, what is happening and how uh, broad, broadly spread is this type of thing that we're talking about today? Well, I won't be able to answer that question, Mikael, but, but I guess just looking at who's in the session, certainly it, it looks like a really global spread. And so it's probably the most global session we've had so far in the in the uh, in the in the festival so from that angle there seems to be at least from a curiosity standpoint a lot grooming uh, around this um but I, but i wouldn't be able to to say like I, i'm mainly uh I'm familiar with with the work that that, that you already kind of mentioned uh, and those sort of pockets in scandinavia and 
in North America and, 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 and a few places elsewhere. So, so, um, uh, so yeah, I, I'll, I'll pass that question over to you, but, um, but I'm mindful of time as well, Mikael. Do, do you have some final wrap up uh, comments? Yeah, uh, I think I think the final wrap up comment is is exactly what Jesper was saying. That this is an emerging practice that that is really relevant for us us as a globe to and institutions and organizations to start start uh, handling and uh, and uh, and thank you everybody for participating. It was great to see so many people from different time zones. So we had somebody somebody from Canada and uh, Emily from Australia and others others from <laughs> between those. Those those different areas and thank you, Ina, for your awesome presentation about the practical practical work that you're doing in this. Thank you. Area. Thank so, you all. Yeah. Thanks yeah. for organizing this. And thanks, oh. Jesper, James, and everybody for organizing this. It was really fun fun chat and to get so many perspectives related to this topic. I think that's really valuable in building the field.